In this fifth lecture, I'm going to open up yet another of these massive questions that we, we're never going to sort out today. But what I can do is try and map out some of the areas of interest. I'll gladly tell you what I think, but I'm also trying to create space for you to think through what you think. In other words, you know, it, it's really trying to open these questions up for further thought. And our question today is this one, you know, how on earth do we figure out what's right? How does science come into this? How does religion, how, how on earth do we think about this question of what is right to do? And you may remember, those of you who were here last time, that in the previous lecture, I began to reflect a little bit on the question of how um, science might feed into some of these big questions about how we ought to behave so let's try and set everything in context before we, we move on and develop this further. I think for me, one of the most fundamental points to make is that, look, if you're a scientist, you're a human being, and scientists have these very highly developed ideas about how the universe works. And I think that is something that really is important. Let me emphasize just this is a good thing and it's an important thing. But there are other questions as well. And we're looking at some of these this afternoon. One of them would be this question, which is, you know, what is the meaning of life? How do we live a good life? And maybe these are questions that are more troubling, more difficult to answer on the basis of a purely scientific approach. And I just want to emphasize that it's very human to ask these questions, not simply to ask them, but to expect that there are some reasonable answers that we can come to, and these actually shape both the way in which we think but also the way in which we live. And the point I'm making here really is building on a point I made in earlier lectures, which is there seems to be a very big world beyond the rather limited world of scientific knowledge. And the question is, how do we hold these things together? And I try to draw a distinction between what I suppose we might call the shallow truths of reason and a rather more deep, rather more engaging, what we might call existential questions about who we are and why we're here. So let's begin by trying to frame the issue. And I thought I'd put on the screen a quote here from Albert Einstein. I quote Einstein quite a lot in these lectures simply because he's very well known, he's very interesting, but also he has put a lot of thought into some of these questions. And in many ways he, he, he's throwing up some ideas that I think you and I can engage with very properly. And Einstein basically was simply making the point here, look, look, science is trying to help us figure out the way things are, the way things work, but there are things beyond its domain, beyond its sphere of competence. And this is what he's saying in this quote. Science can only ascertain what is, not what should be, and outside of its domain, value judgments of all kinds remain ne necessary. And that seems to me to be a point that, that we can't really get away from, that in effect if science is science and not something else, then in effect there are going to be certain areas of knowledge and opinion that do lie beyond its scope. And it seems to me that science maintains its integrity and its distinct identity by focusing on what it can investigate empirically. But that, I think, means also recognizing that there are some larger questions of life that lie beyond its scope. And Einstein here, I think, is really trying to, to highlight this point. In effect, saying, look, science is good, but there are these ethical questions. And these, in effect, are not so much about what is, but about what ought to be. And that moves us in a different direction. This is Sir Peter Medwer, I've quoted him before, but again, a scientist with a very acute instinct for putting his finger on some of the deep questions which actually lay at like the borderline between science and everything else. And Medwer was a, a very, very um, well-known scientist in his day. He won the Nobel Prize for medicine back in 1960. And he was, in effect, a popularly engaged scientist. In other words, a scientist who was very much respected within his community, but also someone who was prepared to engage with the deeper questions that the culture was asking in those days. And Medwer, I think, is asking some questions that really are important. And one of them is this question about where we get our values from. 
Now, Medua, I must emphasize, was a very rational person indeed, and in effect uh, had, had no hesitation whatsoever in denouncing anything or anyone that he thought to be beyond the pale of rational thought. And some of you who have read Peter Medua may know his very famous critique of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who I think Medua regarded as simply someone who substituted his imagination uh, for his reason and felt this was simply about the, the imagination of things rather than actually doing justice to the things that were right. But Medua, although a very rational person, was acutely aware that reason had its limits. I'm going to put on the screen just a few things that he says that I think give us food for thought. In a book uh, containing a chapter on advice to young scientists, he writes these words, which again I think are quite striking. Young scientists must never mistake the necessity of reason for the sufficiency of reason. Now, I like that. It's a beautifully crafted sentence. And what he's saying is, look, we've got to use reason to think. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that is adequate in itself. We may need to draw on something else. And he goes on to make this point. Rationalism falls short of answering the many simple and childlike questions that people ask about their origins and purposes. Uh, Medawa is, is doing two things here. He's saying, look, these are fair and good questions, and we must allow people to ask them, but we must also realise that some of these are actually very difficult to answer on the basis of science alone. But he's also very critical of those who, in effect, say you can just use reason on its own. Now, those of you who have studied recent philosophy will know that in recent years, the critique of reason has focused mainly on the realisation that reason is shaped by our cultural habits and our social location. And that's not really the point that Medawar is making here. He's simply saying that there are some forms of rationalism that simply, in effect, close these discussions down. He writes, it's not to rationalism that we look for answers to these simple questions about origins or about purposes, because rationalism chides the endeavour to look at all. In other words, it's saying these are not real questions. We shouldn't be engaging with them. Medawar is saying, look, they are real questions for ordinary people, and therefore we've got to find a way of making sense of them and at least finding some answers that can be given provisionally. So we have here this issue, which probably most of you will know, from um, Karl Popper. Karl Popper uses the phrase ultimate questions. It's a very simple phrase, and many of you will know it. I've mentioned it briefly in these lectures before. He says, and I quote, science is in no position to make assertions about ultimate questions, about the riddles of existence, or about man's task in this world. And Medawar is just saying, look, these ultimate questions that Karl Popper is raising are meaningful and important. But he goes on to say, these are questions that science, I quote, cannot answer and that no conceivable advance of science would enable it to answer. So, basically, Medawar is, is struggling. He, he's making the point that science is wonderful in terms of clarifying how things work, but saying, in effect, we need more than an account of how things work if we're going to lead meaningful lives. Functionality isn't good enough. We need some deeper understanding of who we are, what this universe is all about, and on the basis of that, we can begin to interact. Now, of course, this is Medawar's opinion. It's one that I personally think is probably along the right lines, but there are others who would take different positions. And Bertrand Russell is a very good example of someone who would say that actually science has a much more positive, more expansive role than perhaps Medawar would suggest. This is from an early book of the 1930s, when Russell declares that whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. 
So this is a controversial area. It's not as if it's obvious that this is right and this is wrong. It is a genuine area of debate and reflection. And in many ways, what I'm trying to do is feed on this discussion and see where we, it takes us. So in this lecture, I'm going to reflect on the question of whether science can tell us what is good. And I think a, a good way of opening this up is just to go back to the previous lecture. And you may remember in that lecture, I was talking a bit about uh, Charles Darwin and his ideas. And towards the end of that lecture, I began to open up this question. If we understand how humanity, in effect, evolves, can we use that knowledge to direct our evolution? In other words, can we use an understanding of how we develop to, in effect, change our development? And I introduced you to the idea of eugenics. Eugenics is this idea that, in effect, we can take charge of our own future by, in effect, preventing certain kinds of people from reproducing altogether, because that would, in effect, um, contaminate or weaken the human gene pool. And it's a very controversial area. And Darwin himself says one or two things which leave me slightly uncomfortable. Um, he makes the point that actually in, um, he used the word savage, we would find that a, a, a word we wouldn't use these days, but um, this is what he says, with savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated, and those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. And he, unfortunately, is using this to reflect on the question of why hospitals might be a mixed blessing. Because yes, they, they help people to survive, but on the other hand, it may mean that weaker people survive and thus raise questions about the future and so on. So it, Darwin is slightly ambivalent about this. But the key point I'm making is that you know, there's a real issue here about how we reflect on the relationship between science and progress. And uh, Darwin here is making the point that civilized societies inhibit this process of elimination through medical and social care, thus enabling the weak members of civilized societies to propagate their kind. I don't think Darwin takes this in any worrying directions. But some of those who came after him, I think, did. And so one of the questions would be, how do we, how do we begin to think through the morality of some of these questions? Is science raising questions about morality that science itself isn't able to answer? Now, again, that's a huge question, but it is, I think, one that many of us will want to think about. And the real danger is about eugenics is that what might be seen as a scientific concern to help humanity survive could easily become a sort of political agenda whereby certain in-groups are given preference and certain out-groups are deprivileged. So there is a real issue there about where this takes us. So, I'm not going to follow this point through any further, partly because it's a very difficult debate, but mainly because my concern is not to follow this debate through, but more to note the general point that it raises. That in effect, we are faced with questions where certain things can be done, but the question is, are they good? Are they bad? Are they right? Are they wrong? And is science able to help us make judgments about what is right and what is wrong. So what I'm going to do, if I may, is begin to develop this discussion by looking at two writers who I think open this up in a very helpful way. They're both atheists. As you'll see, they both take, they take things in very different directions. What I'm going to do is interact with these and try and see how these help us open up some of these questions. I'm going to look at two atheist philosophers, uh, Alex Rosenberg, uh, and a much better known name, Iris Murdoch. And both of these, I think, are very interesting. And although I disagree with both of them at many points, I think that the way they open these questions up for discussion really helps us to think these through. So let's begin with Alex Rosenberg, an American philosopher, very much alive and well. In 2011, he published a book called The Atheist Guide to Reality. 
And if you want the strap line of that work, in other words, the kind of core thesis that lies right at its heart, there it is. Science provides all the significant truths about reality. And knowing such truths is what real understanding is all about. Being scientistic, in other words, relying on science alone or chiefly, just means treating science as our exclusive guide to reality, to nature, both our own nature and everyone else's. And so Rosenberg here is basically arguing that this is a perfectly simple and defensible way of thinking about things. And let's just focus on that word scientistic. Uh, it's right at the end of the third line. It's a word that some of you will come across before, some of you maybe not. It's not a misprint. It is a, a word that is used quite extensively. And it means something like this. Um, the view that science is able to answer life's biggest questions. And if I wanted to give you a, a, another way of looking at this, this is from the uh, American philosopher Massimo Pellucci, who basically is trying to explain what scientism is. And here's his uh, definition of it. It's very similar to what Rosenberg offers. Uh, it's a totalizing attitude that regards science as the ultimate standard and arbiter of all interesting questions. Or alternatively, that seeks to expand the very definition and scope of science to encompass all aspects of human knowledge and understanding. So the question I'm really opening up is this. On some of these big questions, what is right, what is wrong, is science able to answer them? Can we actually live on the basis of the answers that science might able, be able to give us? I'm going to go back to Rosenberg and just look at some of the answers that he gives. Because certainly for Rosenberg, science gives us admirably simple and clear answers to the big questions of life. So basically, what I'm going to do is just quote from him in response to some of these questions. Is there a God? Answer, no. Now, some of you are saying this, this seems an extremely brief summary of what he's saying. And, and you, you might say, can, can, I, can we provide footnotes or open this up? But actually, Rosenberg's a wonderful writer. This is actually his summary in the opening chapters of the book of what he thinks. So I can actually just put this on the screen. This gives you a very, very neat summary of what he thinks. What is the nature of reality? Well, again, again we've all thought about this. And this is absolutely consistent with what Rosenberg thinks. What's the nature of reality? What physics says it is. In other words, it, it's limited, uh, it's well-defined, and then there's nothing, or at least nothing of interest beyond that. We're going to take another one. What's the purpose of the universe? Well, there is none. Uh, and again, many will say, well, you know, we do need to say more. And, and I agree with you. But nevertheless, what, what he is doing is saying, here is my core method. Here is what happens when you apply this method. And it is, I think, very, very clear. And this one, I think, um, again, his word, ditto. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a very neat answer. This one, I think, will trouble you. It certainly troubles me. What's the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? His answer, there's no moral difference between them. Now, I suspect some of you will feel very uneasy about that last one. I think a lot of you would say, well, look, we'd feel happier about this if Rosenberg said something like this. Um, science is unable to help us decide what the moral difference between them is. I think I, think I could live with that. But what Rosenberg is doing is saying, look, we're using this method only, science, and we're limiting ourselves to what science says, and that's the answer you get when you apply that rigorous method. Now, he clearly feels he can live with this. I, I would have to say I, I would really feel very uneasy about that fifth one. But it is helpful, I think, to have this set out so clearly. The point I think that Rosenberg is arguing is that basically um, here is a rigorous, simple, and coherent approach to, to, to the big questions of life. 
And I suppose for most of us, there are two criteria we might use. We might say, well, look, in trying to evaluate an approach, we might begin by saying, well, look, let's judge it by its basis. In other words, what are the reasons for thinking this method might be right? But another way we might judge it is by its outcomes. In other words, you say, well, look, let, let's use this method, see what it gives us, and ask how much we trust the outcome. And what I'm really suggesting is that some of these outcomes leave me a little bit uneasy. And that, I think, is a suspicion I'm sure one or two of you will share with me, but it is nevertheless a very clear example of someone using this method rigorously and consistently. Now, Rosenberg basically makes this point. We have to be nihilists, as some would say nihilists, about the purpose of things in general, about the purpose of biological life in particular, and the purpose of life in general. And he, he says, this, this is, he calls this a nice nihilism. Um, for me, I think it is a very good summary of what he is saying. You know, this method we are using cannot give us answers, and therefore we say there are no answers to be given. And we just have to learn to live with that uncertainty. The question, of course, for most of us would be, we all know there are times when we have to make judgments about what's right, what's wrong, and we do need help in some way to be able to figure out what we ought to do in these situations. So I think there are very important questions here. And I want to begin by saying that um, I, I fully accept that there are some scientists and some philosophers who would say that science is an exclusive guide to reality. And indeed, in, in popular culture, very often, this is the sort of default position. But I think there are concerns here about where this is going to take us. One of the most interesting things that Rosenberg develops later in this book is his argument that... Um, that we are prone to accept certain illusions. And he writes these words. Let me see if I put this in. Um, no, I put in, I'll read this to you. He writes, there is strong evidence that natural selection produces lots of false but useful beliefs. I'll read that again. There is strong evidence that natural selection provides, sorry, produces lots of false but useful beliefs. And his argument here is very, very interesting. He says that one of these false but useful beliefs is that actually we think real thoughts about a real world, whereas in effect, this is simply us believing something that may not be true. Have a look at this quote. Ultimately, Science and scientism are going to make us give up as illusory the very thing conscious experience screams out at us loudest and longest, the notion that when we think, our thoughts are about anything at all, inside or outside of our minds. Now, if you follow that through in the book, which I, I would encourage you to do if you have time, you see that Ro Rosenberg is slightly uneasy about this, but nevertheless is saying, this is where the science seems to take me. My, my feeling about this is this, that you know, this is a, an idea, and in reflecting on the idea, you and I have to decide whether it's right or wrong, or whether the tools we're using to try and answer that question actually work. And really, it, there seems to be a sort of circularity about this. Actually, in effect, reason, which is the tool we have at our disposal to try and engage these questions, is almost being dismissed as something that is prone to give false results. And so I find myself wondering what tools I have at my disposal to kind of check this particular approach out. So I've given you Rosenberg as an example, simply to open up one way of looking at this. I have to say it's not an approach I find entirely persuasive, but it is a very clear, very coherent, very well-defined approach. And for that reason, I'm going to contrast it with Iris Murdoch, uh, who I find uh, much more interesting in many ways. 
And Murdoch, I think, is a name many of you will know, and I'm sure many of you will have read her. What I like about Murdoch in particular is that although she does write works of pure philosophy, she also wrote novels. And very often she used those novels to, to open up in, in the form of a narrative some of the big philosophical and moral questions of her day. Where in effect we, we, we see these things enacted in people's lives, not simply as patterns of abstract thought. And Murdoch was very, very clear that morality was very, very important and it involved challenging ourselves, involved in effect confronting what we want with a vision of what we ought to want. In other words, it's not so much saying morality is what we naturally desire. It's about there being something that forces us to interrogate or critique those natural ideas and ask us whether they're reliable and right. One of the main problems of moral philosophy, she writes, might be formulated thus. Are there any techniques for the purification and reorientation of an energy which is naturally selfish in such a way that when moments of choice arrive, we shall be sure of acting rightly? Now, Murdoch's answer to that question is, well, yes, but it's a complicated answer. And what she is trying to do is to say that to make this work, we have to recognize there is something beyond us which challenges or informs us. So in effect, our natural or innate ideas are subject to scrutiny and challenge by something that's not subjective but is outside us. And her argument basically is that there has to be a transcendent ideal which is capable of capturing both our minds and our imaginations, which in effect presents us with this vision of what is good. And once that captures our imagination, it motivates our conduct. And she sets out this in a number of writings. Um, here is one. Uh, she's quoting from the Book of Common Prayer of 1662 in this little passage. But she's trying to say that we need something beyond us to think about what is right. Talking about the term good, the proper seriousness of the term refers us to a perfection which is perhaps never exemplified in the world we know there is no good in us, but which carries with it the idea of transcendence. And that really is the key theme for Murdoch. We need there to be something beyond us which in effect challenges us and informs us and redirects those selfish thoughts which we so easily have in helpful and good directions. So you can see that Murdoch is moving in a direction which you and I would probably loosely describe as platonic or perhaps platonist. In other words, there is, there is this transcendent world beyond us which is in some way able to impact on our world, giving us a vision of something beyond this world, which nevertheless shapes the way we think and behave in this world. And Murdoch uses this language of transcendence a lot in her writings. Now, let me emphasize, she's an atheist. But she feels she has to have this notion of some kind of transcendent reality to give stability to the idea of moral notions. Here she is. Good is a transcendent reality. That means that virtue is the attempt to pierce the veil of selfish consciousness and join the world as it really is. It's an empirical fact about human nature this attempt cannot be entirely successful. And you can see the point she's, she, she's really grasping at here, that in effect um, we need something to illuminate us, to redirect us, and that's not something within us, but something beyond us. Now, many of you will know that Murdoch was writing these thoughts back in the 1960s and early 1970s, and at that time, Murdoch was based at Oxford, and at Oxford at that time, any notion of transcendence was regarded with a certain degree of ridicule in the professional philosophical circles in which she worked. Yet Murdoch insisted that we need some idea like this 
if we're going to make sense of human experience in general and moral experience in particular. So one of Murdoch's core insights then is that we have to act within this world, within an empirical reality, but that in itself and of itself isn't good enough to enable or sustain our moral vision. And Murdoch is basically saying, look, the sciences are, are wonderful, but they just cannot deliver this transcendent vision that we need to inform and empower our moral vision. Inform, I've talked about that already, empower. That means excite us, motivate us, make us want to feel we're part of something bigger and become part of this moral vision. So if we were to set Murdoch and Rosenberg side by side, they're both philosophers, they're both atheists, but you can see they are coming at this from very different angles indeed. I think you'll probably have gathered that my own sympathies are much more with Murdoch, and indeed I'll be exploring her a little bit more in a moment. But this, this debate or discussion between Murdoch and, and um, Rosenberg, I think, illustrates very well the key questions that lie behind this lecture. Can science help us here? And if it can't, well, where do we go? So it's a very interesting question, I think, to raise. What Murdoch is saying is that we need something beyond science if morality is to be stabilized and liberated from changing fashions and moods. So if Murdoch is right that as moral beings we're immersed in a reality um, uh, which transcends us, then where does that kind of thinking take us? Now, up to this point, I've kind of indicated I quite like the way in which Murdoch is going. But I'm going now to just to raise a question which seems to me to cause her difficulty. And it's this. Here is a question I would ask of Murdoch. If she is right, and there's this transcendent thing called the good, remember that very famous lecture, The Sovereignty of Good, where she talks about this, this radiant vision of goodness, which energize and motivates us. Well, if she is right, how do, we, how do we actually know what it's like? Where do we see this, if you like, enacted? In other words, is this just some sort of abstract idea which each of us understands in our own way? Or, or is there some way in which this transcendent idea is disclosed or embodied so we can actually see what it's like? And Murdoch, actually, in her novels, is very, very good about this. She, she presents characters who exemplify in their lives the kind of moral virtues she's talking about. But for me, the Achilles heel of Murdoch's moral vision is that um, we, how do we actually see what this is like? It, it, very, it very easily becomes simply an abstract idea beyond us rather than something that we can somehow relate to and give us excitement. How do we give substance to this ideal? And that, for me, is an issue that seems to me to be important here. If I could use a theological word to try and put my finger on what I think is the problem here, I think that we need goodness to be incarnated. In other words, to take some sort of form in our own world so we can see it and say that gives us an idea about what it is and motivates us to want to be like it. So if we use classic Platonic imagery, the kind that Murdoch is clearly interested in, we would need to talk about how we have access to the ideal of the good. How can we mediate between this transcendent world of goodness and our own world? And that, to me, is a problem that I think Murdoch has. If I were now to just begin to approach this from a more Christian angle, I would really want to pick up on this theme of incarnation. Namely, that the transcendent actually enters into and becomes present within and embodied within our own human history. In other words, if I could just use classical theological language, we could say that truth Beauty and goodness, those three words are very often linked together as the so-called platonic triad, truth, 
beauty and goodness can be seen in Christ incarnated within the actualities of life. Now, there's a lot more I need to say here, but I think some of you will be saying, well, look, this, this is quite interesting, but, but persuade us that this notion of a transcendent good actually really matters. And I think that's a, a fair question. So I'm going to do this by giving you a historical example, which I think might be helpful here. And we're going to look at a, a, a situation that arose in Nazi Germany in the late 1930s. And we're looking at a man called Heinrich Rommel, um, not a name I would expect any of you to know. It, it, he's quite obscure, but he wrote a little book uh, called The Eternal Return of Natural Law. And let me tell you why he wrote it. And, and I think once you see that, maybe this will become a lot clearer and maybe a lot more interesting as well. The problem was that um, you know, Adolf Hitler came to power yeah, really, by 1934, German, he was in the process of being um, Nazified, including its legal frameworks. And the real issue was, if you define goodness in terms of doing what the law said, and the law books have been rewritten to reflect a Nazi perspective, then in effect you are locked into a sort of legal positivism which could only have one outcome. And Heinrich Roman was a, a lawyer who just said, look, this, this is terrible. There has to be something beyond law by which law is to be judged. I think many of you will recognize that sentiment very, very easily. That in effect there are own human laws, but these could easily be hijacked by political pressure groups or by particular in-groups. We need something beyond law. And in many ways, what Roman is saying is we need some understanding of natural law whereby there is some transcendent idea of goodness or justice over which we have no control, which in effect must inform what we think about goodness and justice. Otherwise, those who are in power are simply going to invent ideas which suit their own particular agendas and concerns. Now, some of you will say, well, you know, Roman was writing during the Nazi period, which was atypical and very, very unusual, happily. But nevertheless, I think he does make a very fair point. We need something, if I can put it like this, by which what we think is right can be interrogated. Are you really sure about this? Or are you simply locked into conventional ways of thinking? Now, it's not a, a, an abstract question, I'm afraid. Many of you will have read the philosopher Richard Rorty, R-O-R-T-Y, uh, a very interesting American pragmatist philosopher who I think has written some of the most interesting works of philosophy recently. And Rorty takes the view that actually what we perceive to be just or right is largely the outcome of social conventions. And he, he, this is where he talks about this in his book, The Consequences of Pragmatism. Some of you will know this book. If not, it's a very interesting book. And Rorty here is simply making the point that, um, in effect, uh, we decide what is right. It's a matter of social convention. And um, there is no need to invoke anything transcendent. We decide for ourselves. Which has, he concludes, one important implication. And it's this. There is nothing deep down inside us except what we've put there ourselves. No criterion that we have not created in the course of creating a practice. No standard of rationality that's not an appeal to such a criterion. No rigorous argumentation that is not obedience to our own conventions. Now, it's quite a long sentence, but the, the gist of it is, look, we have this, this uh, as we call it, a groupthink, uh, a, a way of thinking which becomes settled and crystallized. And once that's happened, you can't get outside it. Everything is, in effect, shaped by this settled understanding of what things are. It cannot be challenged. It cannot be interrogated. And a lot of cultural commentators would say that Rorty is describing very well the problem. In effect, those in cultural power very often 
just get locked into certain ways of thinking. But Rorty doesn't help us ask what might be done to break free from this. In fact, Rorty himself was very, very clear that actually this was a real problem. And this is one of the most famous sentences from uh, this book, where Rorty, in effect, is saying, look, there is a problem with what I'm thinking, but I can't see a way around it. And this is reflections on the implications of his viewpoint. He believes it to be right, to be better than alternatives, but nonetheless, there is this niggling concern that just isn't going to go away, and it's this. When the secret police come, when the torturers violate the innocent, there is nothing to be said of them in the form there is something within you which you are betraying. Though you embody the practices of a totalitarian society which will endure forever, there is something beyond those practices which condemns you. Now, it's an interesting quote. Again, Rorty doesn't solve this problem, but he does give us this very, very interesting insight that there's something not quite right. Yes, there is this, we do have this tendency as human beings to get locked into certain ways of thinking, and we need something beyond those practices. But how does that break in? So it seems to me that raises some very interesting questions. For Rorty, the truth of moral values depends upon their existence and their acceptance within society. But many of his critics are anxious about this. They would say, using a technical phrase, that Rorty simply reifies social practices. In other words, he takes what we do and, in effect, constructs from that a way of thinking about justice. And, in effect, what we do, what we're used to doing, is treated as being, in effect, much the same as righteousness or justice. Heinrich Roman's idea of the eternal return of natural law, I think, is hinted at in what Richard Rorty says. But I have to be very honest with you and say, actually, Roman's own approach is equally difficult. And I go back to that point that Iris Murdoch makes, we need a transcendent vision of goodness to challenge our own understandings of what is right and good. But how do we find out what that is? And again, Roman has that same difficulty. So for me, uh, some of you here will I think, probably disagree, but for me, natural theology is actually probably best thought of as a critical tool. It's something that says to us, look, we need something like this to prevent us from lapsing into these self-centered and um, group-perpetuated ways of thinking. But actually, it's very hard to know how we gain access to this. Because if we could, then that would surely sort everything out very, very quickly indeed. So how do we begin to make a connection with religion? Well, let me just begin to open this up. It's a huge question. What I'm going to do, if I may, is just begin to map out some of the questions and maybe giving, give you the beginnings of answers and leave you plenty of space to think these things through for yourselves. For me, I think, one of the major issues we have to confront is this. Part of the inheritance of the Enlightenment is this idea that we are the masters of our own souls, the determiners of our own destinies. You might remember that famous line, you know, I am the the captain of my soul, I am the master of my own destiny. That's very much this idea that we find out. And in her book, The Sovereignty of Good, which I've hinted at already in this lecture, Iris Murdoch points out that this idea that humanity is autonomous, capable of achieving our own goals and destinies, actually in many ways still lingers in Western culture and goes back to the time of the Enlightenment. I think there are two issues here that we might need to think about. One is this pervasive question, can science or reason actually tell us what is right? Or is morality actually about something that's beyond morality, which nevertheless gives us a vision of things which helps us to figure out what is right and what is wrong? And that's one thing, knowing what's right, knowing what's wrong. But there is 
another question, which I'm sure will have occurred to you as I've been speaking, and it's this. What happens if it's not quite as simple as that? Suppose we were very, very good people naturally, so we said, that's what's good, that's what I'm going to do. What happens if there's something wrong with us, if we are weak or foolish? So we say, well, look, that's what good is, but either I can't do it or I don't want to do it. What happens if in some way there is a flaw, a defect, a vulnerability of human nature, whereby the recognition of what is right does not lead us to do what is right? So there's a very interesting question here about human nature lying beneath this. Uh, some of you will know uh, Tennyson's very long, but I think very good poem, In Memoriam. And it has this line, we needs must love the highest when we see it. Let me give it to you again. We needs must love the highest when we see it. And, you know, I, I would love to think he's right, but part of me um, thinks that might be wrong. There's a line in Horace, which some of you will know, uh, we see the good and we approve it, but we actually go and do something much worse. And you know, that just seems to be an awful lot closer to where we are. And so what I'm beginning to open up now is this, this whole question of the understanding of human nature, where in effect we might be using the language of sin, we might be using the language of selfishness, but we are beginning to ask, what if there is something about human nature which means there's a tension between knowing what is good and actually being able to do that? Many of you will know the famous lines that Lord Acton wrote in his letter of 1887. Power, he wrote, tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I read that again, even though I think most of you will recognize it immediately. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I think actually that there is, there's a real point of importance being made there. But I want to suggest to you that maybe there is a point of concern for me, the, the, the thing that isn't quite persuasive about this is it seems to assume that human beings are perfectly good and decent people, and then suddenly they get hold of power and that corrupts them. In other words, they were fine, and then power takes over and they start doing things which they wouldn't have done before. They become bad. What my concern would be, well, supposing actually there is something about us already which could develop in that direction. So power doesn't so much cause it as in effect creates a context within which this tendency could be actualized. Now, there's a proverb in uh, a collection of Anglo-Saxon writings in the University of Durham which says something slightly different. I'm going to read it to you twice. Uh, this is what it says. Man does as he is when he can do what he wants. I'll say it again. Man does as he is when he can do what he wants. What the problem is saying is, look, supposing you and I can do anything we like. There are no constraints. We just do what we want to. I'm sure some of you would do some wonderful things. I think I might do some awful things. In other words, you know, the, you know, this might give me permission to do things which I've been trying to suppress for all kinds of reasons. And the question is, were does that take us? If that proverb is right, that means that when all constraints are removed, when there's no accountability or limitations, then we behave according to our true natures. In other words, it's not so much that this corrupts us, it's that this gives us the opportunity to show ourselves as we really are. Now, that's a very troubling thought, because if that's right, then power isn't about corrupting, it's about exposing, bringing out what's already there, but which is suppressed through the force of social convention or the need to conform to customs or expectations. And on that second view, power, in effect, is about a mirror of the human soul. When we're able to do what we like, then we begin to show what we really are like. And that tends to be a little bit disturbing. Many of you will have read William Golding's book, The Lord of the Flies. You know, it's again it's about a group of school children. 
who are placed in a situation where all the social conventions are abolished. And the way they behave basically reverts to something else. And it's a very, very troubling um, idea indeed. Some of you have read um, Stephen Pinker's recent book. Is it called... Um, it, it, the word angels or angelics in the title, it, it's in effect this idea that the world's becoming a much better place, that civilization is able to, in effect, sustain us in a way that actually might not have been possible you know, generations before. And though I'm very sympathetic to that, my concern is that civilization is actually quite vulnerable, and we might lose something very important through precisely the processes that William Golding suggests here. So anyway... This is a question that seems to me to stand out from our reflections in the final part of this lecture. Are we fundamentally good and capable of learning and practicing what is good? And the optimist inside me would like to think that's right. In that case, all we need to be done, all that needs to happen is to be shown what is good and we will do it. Or is there something about human nature which prevents us from acting on those insights so that we may know the good but choose to do what is not good. I think most of us feel that tension from time to time. Sometimes you know, you'll find authors talking about um, the lure of evil. In other words, you know, you know it's wrong, but there's something heady, something mysterious about it that draws you towards it. It has a sort of heady perfume that proves to be irresistible. So in an earlier lecture, I was talking a bit about the Christian doctrine of creation. And maybe it's time just to bring, bring that back in to think about where we are in our reflections. The Christian perspective would be that we're part of God's creation. We need to learn and accept our place within that created order. Um, but, of course, that, that does raise a whole series of questions. Some would argue that the world would be a better place if we got rid of God altogether and put human beings in God's place. And indeed, as you all know, many of the more idealistic writers of the 19th century, like Ludwig Feuerbach or, um, or indeed Swinburne uh, here in England, uh, would insist that the only way to eliminate the ills of the world was to enthrone humanity as the lord of the earth. And again, it's a very tempting idea, but some would say Nazism and Stalinism might be the outcome of that, and maybe it's not quite that straightforward. But there's a second element to the Christian understanding of things. Yes, we bear God's image, but there's also this idea of sin, that in some way there is some, some trait within us, some flaw in our natures, which means that we know what is good and yet end up doing that which is not good. And you might therefore say that even though from a Christian perspective we are the height of the created order, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Actually, we have this um, irony that although we might be at the apex of the created order, we still have this moral ambivalence which constantly needs challenging and reflecting. And those of you who read the New Testament will probably think of that line from Paul's letter to the Romans where he talks about being unable to do the good that he would like to and ends up doing the things that are not good that he doesn't want to do but nevertheless seems to be something within him which makes him do it. So there are lots of interesting questions to think about here. I thought it might be good to end by looking at Richard Dawkins. Um, this is the, um, one of the final um, sections of his first book, The Selfish Gene. And uh, this is really interesting. Um, Dawkins, in that book, is talking about the way in which we dance to the music of our DNA. That in some sense, in effect, uh, we, we are selfish because there is something genetic within us which moves us in that direction. So though a lot of the book is about portraying us as being prisoners of our genes, right at the end of the book, he begins to say, look, we, it isn't that bad. We can break free from this. He writes... We have the power to defy the selfish genes of our birth and, if necessary, the selfish memes of our indoctrination. Memes, they're a, a word that actually Dawkins invented. It means something like uh, something within our culture that traps us in our thinking. 
We are built as gene machines, cultures, meme machines, but we have the power to turn against our creators. We alone on Earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. And it's a wonderful, I think, closing section for any book. Um, and in effect, what Dawkins is saying is, look, we are constrained, we're infants, we're even trapped by our own biological heritage, but there's something we can do to break free of this. And although, I, again, I'm very sympathetic to this, I do wonder if actually, if we are able to rebel against it, can we actually break free, or can we actually only do this in part? I think the, the big question, I suppose, would be this. Um, Dawkins is helping us to see that we can be trapped by our genetic heritage, and that is a very, very important insight to have. But having that insight on its own isn't enough to enable you to break free from it. And the question is whether we need something else to empower us or motivate us to break free from it. And again, the answer to that question is a long one, but it's a fascinating question to begin to ask. So, I have to confess that I've opened up some very interesting questions, but I've not really answered them. What I've tried to do is to say, look, these are significant questions, and all of us have, have thought about these things, have wrestled with them, and what I'm trying to suggest in this lecture is that maybe science helps in some ways, but not in others, to think about these things. And I have my own way of answering these questions, I'm sure you have too, but they are fascinating questions to think about. So, in um, my final lecture in the series next um, month, I think it is, um, I want to wrap up on these uh, series of lectures by kind of way standing back a little and asking, you know, how could we, in effect, think of some sort of creative interaction between science and faith that might give us a better way of thinking about things and looking about things. I think one of the things I've been very conscious I have not done at all well in lectures to date is actually to say, well, look, here is a way in which science might enrich faith. Here is a way in which faith might enrich science. And so I hope to redress that deficiency in the next final lecture. But I also would like to talk a little bit about what I'm planning for next year's lectures, which I think you might find really very interesting. But anyway, I will tell you more about that next time we meet. It just remains for me to thank you very much indeed for being here today. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>